Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. If someone were to be pre-diabetic, right, and then let's say that they have some of that kind of endotoxemia, some of that leaky gut, um, and then they decide, you know what, I'm just going to cut out sugar. And so would that, and maybe even incorporate some fasting, right? Because they say fasting can, you know, heal some of the damage in your cell, cells. Um, so how does that pertain to the microbiome then? So, I mean, does it heal some of that or? Right. So just stopping the things that are, that are, that are dysfunctional to the gut won't heal it. Uh, we do have to provide the gut with certain tools. So let's talk about the parts that need to be healed in order to seal up the gut lining, right? So first and foremost, um, we need to increase the diversity in the microbiome. One of the, one of the key characteristics of a dysfunctional microbiome that leads to leakiness, endotoxemia, and all of the risk for chronic low-grade inflammation is loss in diversity in the microbiome. So that's the first part. Um, the second part is we need to upregulate the, the, the presence of keystone strains. So there are these really important bacterial strains within your microbiome that are called keystone strains because they help hold up the rest of the ecosystem. And then they also directly provide protection against a large number of chronic illnesses. In the case of diabetes, Acromantia mucinophila is an example, right? It's inversely correlated with diabetes, which means that when acromantia is high, you are protected against diabetes. When acromantia is low, you have a much higher risk of developing diabetes. So we have to get those keystone strains up. So we need increased diversity, which means more microbes, more different species um, in, a, in a more even type of setting within the microbiome. That's an important part because you can have diversity where you have lots of different species, but the vast majority of those species are at very small amounts that they're really not functional, and your microbiome is taken over by a, whole, by, by a small handful of other microbes, right? So that dis, dis, um, proportion in their relative abundance is not conducive to appropriate diversity. You need to have lots of different species, but you need to have some degree of uniformity as well. So that's a really important part. Then those keystone strains like Acromantia, Fecalum bacteria, we have to bring those up as well. When those two things are, are improved and adjusted, then the other thing that starts to improve is the production of certain postbiotics. And the postbiotics are essential nutrients and metabolites that are produced by your microbiome that we really can't get in adequate amounts from our diet. For example, short chain fatty acids like um, propionate, acetate, butyrate, valerate, and so on, or things like urolithins, like urolithin A that are, com that are converted from polyphenols. These are all absolutely essential to the cellular functions at the lining of the gut, the cellular functions in your liver, your pancreas, all of the tissues in your body, and we need them to be produced from the microbiome. Now, once we have those things in place, then the microbes can start helping the healing of the microbiome. And it's really important to keep in mind that we do not have a way of healing our own gut lining, right? We actually count in large part for, for signals from certain microbes to be able to do that for us. Um, and that's an important part because remember, we have very limited genetic material, right? We have 22,000 functional genes. A lot of those code for certain pathways. Many of them code for just our physical characteristics, our eye color and skin color, hair and shape and all that stuff, right? So we don't have enough genetic material in our little um, genetic chest to code for every little thing we need. So we have evolved to outsource a lot of that function to really important bacteria. And, and a lot of those bacteria, if we're not getting adequate amounts of them in us, and we're not getting adequate exposure to them, they can't do that job for us. So one, give me, I'll give you one example of that. The, the spaces in between the intestinal epithelial cells, right? That's, uh, that's uh, those spaces most people have heard about, they're called the tight junctions. Yes. The tight junctions ma maintain that seal in between the cells, right? Inside the tight junction, the thing that controls the space are 40 different proteins. They're called clodin oclodin proteins. So they are the lattice, which allows it to open up should big nutrients need to get through, but then also closes it shut so that things like bacterial toxins and, and other things in the outside environment don't leak through. 
the expression of those claudin and aquadin proteins are extremely important uh, because cells on the intestinal lining will continually die off like any other cells in your body. And so when they get replaced by new cells, we need to increase the expression of those proteins so that things keep sealing up. The expression of those proteins, so far we have not seen any mechanism in our own body for us to endogenously stimulate the expression of those proteins. We require signals from microbes that come into our system that actually stimulate the expression of those proteins, right? So the ability of our gut lining to heal itself is not just about taking away the offending things that seem to affect it. You also have to put in very specific tools to be able to start regenerating or generating that process of healing. Um, so just taking away certain foods, taking away certain chemicals, doing all that, that's better for your gut and it will start to attempt to heal to a certain degree, but you have to work on those key parts of the microbiome, the increase in diversity, the increase in uh, keystone strains, and just fasting alone is not going to do it. So what, what are those key, I mean, what, I mean, how do we increase those keystone um, strains and the diversity? Yeah. So, you know, the, you mentioned fasting. So fasting will, will help to some degree. That's a, always a good thing. It's one of the things I do every single day. Um, but really, it's about expanding the diversity in your diet, right? You, you want to start adding in some really unique things that you don't typically eat. Um, you want to add in if you're, if you're predominantly a meat eater, then you want to eat more raw meat as well. You want to get closer to raw meat because here's one of the things. If you look at certain tribes, and we can talk about tribes like Inuit Indians and all that, um, one of the ways that they sustain themselves is they eat raw meat. Uh, one of the differences between raw and cooked meat is raw meat contains a lot of glycogen so, and from the animals, right? So you're actually getting carbohydrates with your meat to feed certain types of bacteria and then also increase, um, um, increase your energetics as well. But on also eating connective tissue and cartilage and all that stuff, it provides you different nutrients. Um, so you want to expand what you're eating if your focus is on meat. Um, if you can start adding in things like roots and tubers and nuts, uh, those kinds of things contain different types of uh, resistant starches and all that that feed and increase the growth of microbes in the, in the large bowel. Um, so that's a big part of it is just kind of increasing what you're putting into your system. Um, and if you have foods that, you're, that you know are offensive to your system, stay away from them, um, which is fine but you want to start trying to add in foods that, um, that, do, that, that will provide some degree of diversity. So one of the important categories is like urolithins. Urolithins are these really important compounds that are derived in the microbiome that affect mitochondrial function in your cells, that affect the regeneration of new cells and regeneration of new mitochondria. It also allows the removal of dead and, and, and dysfunctional cells. All of those urolithins are, are created in the microbiome from polyphenols. So you want to get like some flavonoids and things like that in there um, so that you can feed those microbes and allow them to produce these urolithins, right? So that's, that's an important part as well. Um, and then a big thing is putting in bacteria that we've outsourced these functions to, right? When we started looking at solving the problem of leaky gut, we started looking at, okay, if we can't do it ourselves, meaning we don't have a system in our own body to go, I'm going to heal this torn up lining, right? Like we do with our skin. If our skin gets cut, there's a lot of indication that we can express certain enzymes and all that to start healing that skin. But we don't have that same capability in our gut lining. So we said, okay, we must have outsourced this function to bacteria that we would encounter in the environment. And so then we start digging into the research to see if there was any evidence of that. And sure enough, there was tons of evidence of that um, in animal studies. So they were, they've been doing these studies on leaky gut in chickens and pigs and all that for like 60 years, right? So there's a ton of data on it. Um, and we found that they found certain environment, ubiquitous environmental bacteria, these spore-based bacteria to, uh, in particular, that had the capability of going into our system and then one of the key things that they do is they turn on genes to increase the expression of those tight junction proteins. They also turn on genes to start to increase the height of the microvilli. So they're regenerating uh, actual length of your intestines, right? So they, so they have all of these capabilities of doing this really intricate repair work on the gut lining. So we said, okay, 
that hasn't been shown in humans yet, but I, we presume it probably works the same way in humans because we are also supposed to get exposure to those same types of bacteria in the natural environment. So we published our first paper in 2017 showing that in a 30-day period, just by adding the bacteria without doing any dietary changes, without removing anything offensive, like these are healthy young college kids, meaning when I say healthy, I mean they don't have any chronic illness, they're not on any medications, but they're eating fast food and they're drinking and they're doing all the stuff that's not good for you. And even then we were able to completely seal up their gut and we published a study in a, in a major gastroenterology journal and it was published as a frontier paper because no one had published yet showing that a bacteria can actually heal the le leakiness in the gut in humans. So you got to get the bacteria in as well, you know? And so people will say all the time to me like, well, you know, I eat more of an ancestral diet already and, you know, I'm getting all the, the, the rich, healthy foods. Um, so do I really need to add in a pro, quote unquote probiotic? And my response always is, you have to remember that when our ancestors ate those foods, their, their food was covered in microbes, right? They didn't have sterilization processes. When our ancestors ate meat, when they ate roots and tubers and forage for things, they got dirt on everything. All of these microbes were, were um, teeming all over the food that they ate. And so they were getting a natural amount of these microbes with their, with their uh, diet. We're just not getting that right now. We don't get that because most of our food supply is sterile um, or sterilized to a certain degree. So it becomes really important to add back those really important functional organisms that do this repair work for us. Mm -hmm.